Okay, and we're live. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, so well, greetings, fellow Godless Rockers. I'm Steve. And I'm Tally from Most Show Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Nate. You All right. Joining us here today is Nathan Feltz, author, LGBTQ rights activist, badass public speaker on the topic of religion and child abuse, and fellow godless rocker. Thanks, Nate, for being on our show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, you guys. Awesome. So. All right. So, <clears throat> childhood indoctrination, escape from religion, and more on this episode of Godless, godless Rockers. Rockers. We also want to thank our patrons. Robert, Kenneth, Six Spider, Joe Davis, and Adrian for helping us make these shows happen. Please support us on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Down in hell, this direction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Steve. So, um, Nate, we're going to kick this off with a little game called This or That. Have you heard of it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna give you two items okay. and it's up to you to pick one or the other which basically you're saying which you prefer and the other you'd have to live without forever okay, oh, okay. all right so are you ready to go i'm ready <laughs> okay <laughs> the first one since we're here in november it's a thanksgiving based one oven roasted turkey or honey baked ham uh i pick honey baked ham Oh, all right. Yeah. What did I win? <laughs> we have a few more. There's four oh, more. Okay. Four more to know if you win so, the, so that, the grand that, prize. That response does that mean I lost that? I missed that one or what? <laughs> well, sometimes it's we a, talk about if you. we agree or not. I mean, I'm, I'm turkey all the way. Me too. It, so, uh -oh. so we I'd have, have a disagreement. Be, but we that's have a about disagreement it. <laughs> 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 here. <laughs> no, this is just to get to know more about you, just for fun. Okay. All right, so here's the second question. And um, by the way, I'm talking bands here, not cities. Kansas okay. or Boston? Got to be Kansas. Kansas, why is that? Because that's where I grew up, and I, uh, the town I lived in was uh, the hometown of five or four of their five members. And I don't know, I just have been a huge Kansas fan my whole life. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Right on. All right. Here goes number three. The United States or Canada? Oh, you're going to put me on the spot here. Hey? <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have to go with you. I got to go with Canada, guys. They, yeah. they, they fit my politics a lot better, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really looking that way. I got to say, Canada's looking pretty tempting. Yeah. Except for the cold part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is that. <laughs> Can you please tell us, direct us, because we've been, we've been considering moving there, but can you please tell me what area of Canada might be sort of like Hawaii-like? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're out of luck there. <laughs> I did hear there's deserty areas. Yeah, just actually just west of me, kind of in the middle of uh, the, the central middle of British Columbia is a desert. Yeah. yeah. Hard to imagine, hey? Yeah. It is very hard to imagine. Is it like still a cold desert? I don't understand how it could be a desert in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's exactly how I would. I mean, it's, it, obviously, it's going to get snow and it, it gets colder, um, but it's just like there's no vegetation. It's you know it has that kind of uh, of topography there. Um, but yeah, during the summer, it's like a freaking desert. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, we're probably out because no Hawaii. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, well, if, you, if, if you want a rainy Hawaii, you could probably pick the Vancouver coast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, rain doesn't really work for Tally. Or yeah. snow. No. Snow is not rainy. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big fan of rain either. So. We lived in Portland for about a year, and, uh, yeah. and uh, somebody missed the sun quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, are we ready for question number four? Yep. You're almost at the grand finale. Congratulations. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number four is top or bottom? Uh, I'm going to say top. <laughs> right, I would say I care no to elaborate, about, but, but no. 
<laughs> I don't ask anybody if they'd like to elaborate on that one. No. So no, cool. next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. This was a tough one. This, this last one is a tough one, and it's the final question. Okay. Skepticism or humanism? Humanism. Care to elaborate? Well, I just actually I'm reading a book right now called The Righteous Mind that uh, talks a lot about how, you know, the, the science behind uh, how we develop our morality. And it just it creates a lot of grayness in my thinking about skepticism and and um, rationalism. And but humanism is a that's more of a moral code, I think, than. Uh, than uh, a way of thinking, I guess. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. And humanism fits my my uh, sense of of uh, what's important in life. Does okay. that make sense? So it's, you're talking about basically the difference between like skepticism is basically a way to think and a way to understand what's right. true and what's not true. Yes. Whereas humanism is more of a philosophy, philosophy that, can, yeah. that can help yeah. you understand the world in a moral way. Am I getting close? Yeah, simplified for me with humanism is is the focus is on the well-being of humans because all we've got is the here and now as opposed to a focus on the hereafter and and uh, a divinity notion as far you know as far as a philosophy. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Congratulations, you won. <laughs> you won more questions, unfortunately. <laughs> more serious questions, I should say, maybe. Yes. All right. Um, by the way, um, you guys who are joining us, can we see them or no? I don't know if we can see mm -hmm. them. I, we're still trying to figure out this thing, so I'm yeah. sorry if you've made comments and we don't see them. But if you are making comments, Please, please do that. We have the group chat turned on, and we're looking at that. And I don't know if that's going to give us the comments or not, or if we're just going to see them on Tally's cell phone, which she's trying yeah, to boot up. Yeah, can you show me real quick how I would do that? Uh, after this, once I ask a question and, okay. and, and such, I will fiddle with the phone. Um, <clears throat> so let's dive right in. You are one of the 13 children of the infamous Fred Phelps. That's we're right. To, yep. Number six. To, Number six. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the evil number. So you're the middle child, pretty much. Yeah, one of the middle childs, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm also a middle child, but middle of three, so it makes it really easy to do the math there. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> so he was the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, which is world famous for God hates fags, picket signs, and the protesting of military funerals. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in that world? Yeah, it was uh, it was a an extremely violent environment, uh, very uh, dictatorial. Uh, you know, the rigid theology that we were supposed to live by. Uh, it, his theology is is a kind of what I call a hyper Calvinism, and uh, for those who understand what that is, it's it's um, well. The essence of Calvinism is that uh, all of us are rightfully doomed to hell, and God, in His graciousness, uh, picks a, a select few, uh, and they're the only ones that are going to go to heaven. And they have no say in it. Nobody has any say in whether they have salvation. So it kind of turns uh, mainstream Christianity, Christianity on its ear in that regard, because most folks believe all they have to do is say the prayer and ask for uh, Christ to enter their life. So, uh, so that, that created a lot of, uh, of negative emotions. It was a really negative environment as far as how one looked at themselves. Right. So that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that it was basically kind of, you're already doomed to hell in the first place. Is that? Yeah, yeah so, that's right. Yeah, okay. God, humans are, are instruments of God's wrath. Uh, there was there was a famous American theologian, uh, Jonathan Edwards, back uh, in the 1800s, 
and he did a famous sermon that was was very popular. This is one of the interesting things about Calvinism. It was it was mainstream back in the you know 100 150 years ago, uh, and his sermon was called uh, "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." And one of the lines that's that's most popular out of that is something along the lines of the only thing that uh, keeps all of us out of hell, it, you know, at any moment is God's graciousness. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. And, and <laughs> <laughs> that's borderline well, medieval well times, though. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's okay. Well, this this is really kind of mind blowing to me because. I thought, you know, with the whole God hates fags, if everybody's going to hell anyway, then why bother telling anybody that God hates fags or why bother protesting military funerals? What are you trying to accomplish? If, exactly, if right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And the, their, their answer is kind of anemic because all they can respond with is because the Bible tells us to. The Bible tells us to hold the, the cup of God's wrath to the lips of, of America and force them to see the truth. Mm. That's wow. that's all they got, right? That's all a lot of people have, though. If you think about it, when I question my brother on my brother does like apologetics and things, very involved in the church, he was a missionary and stuff. And when I question him on things, it's just this big circular reasoning thing that he always goes back to because the Bible says so. Yeah. It always returns to that because the Bible says so. It doesn't matter what happens in our conversations. Well, because the Bible says so, and it's like. Ugh. Yeah. So there's no there's no individual accountability in those kind of, of, of belief systems, and I I've referred to it before as as kind of the divine Nuremberg defense, where you know we're just we're just doing what we're told, right? So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Don't think for ourselves. We just we follow orders. Mm-hmm. That's sad. That's really interesting, yeah. and. Um, but what was it, what was it like for you personally? What, you know, you, you grew up in this environment. What? Yeah. So growing up in an environment like that, like everybody, you know, what you're told, what you're taught is reality. You know, it, when you're a young child, you don't have the capacity to, um, or the permission, if you will, to, to say, well, what about this, especially in an environment like that? So, so I, I took it in and accepted it as, as fact um, as, I mean, I didn't have a choice really. Right. So, um, but there was a part of me and I can't explain it. That was a rebellious and in that kind of environment with that kind of uh, personality that my father was, there was uh, any kind of rebellion was, was violently quashed anytime it, it reared its head, right? So there was, my father had actually, um, when I, I think I was maybe seven or eight years old and, and he gathered all the kids together and he brought in this Maddox handle, which is, a Maddox is this tool that you use to like dig roots out of the, of the earth. And it's, the handle's about four feet long and it's about, uh, at the circ, at the, at the base end, it's about, uh, 12 or 13 inches in circumference. So it's a huge solid piece of wood. And he announced that that was the tool he was going to use to discipline the kid <clears throat> going forward. Right. Mm. So, Jesus. So when he would get upset and it wasn't just a matter of, okay, you did something wrong, you got spanked and that was the end of it. He, he would go into these uh, rages that would last literally for hours, literally would go on for hours. And he would use that Maddox handle, um, such that, you know, so he would hit us seven or eight times and the, he would swing it like a baseball bat. So the blows were mm. so, so intense that the skin would, would swell on the back, you know, on your butt and on your, the back of your legs. And then he'd sit there for half hour, 45 minutes yelling at us, you know, quoting Bible verses out of the Old Testament about how, you know, if this was biblical times, we'd take you outside the city gates and stone you for your rebellion. <laughs> That oh kind of stuff. Oh my gosh, so wow. frightening. And then he'd go back to the beating, and by that time the skin is so tender and so swollen that it would split the skin when he hit it again, right? Mm. So, so then you'd see this, you'd have this kind of clear liquid oozing mm. out of it. So that was, 
And then, you know, he would use, it wasn't just that. He would, sometimes he'd grab the kid by their arms, lift him up and drive his knee into their stomach and, and uh, used his fist. Uh, and he was really good with that because he was a, uh, in his youth, he was a golden glove boxer. So he had a talent for that. So mm. those were all of the, the physical aspects of it. But really, ultimately, that physical stuff goes away for the most part. But it was the rhetoric. It was the language we heard constantly about how we were, were evil and that we were sinners and that we didn't deserve to be alive. And so you, you get that message and you take it in and you own it. And by the, so by the time I was in my late teens, I realized that I didn't belong there. And so I was just treading water. And over the last six months that I was there, I started pl plotting and, and um, bought a car without anybody knowing about it. And I kept it <laughs> hidden. And, and then on the night of my 18th birthday, I packed all my things, it's hid, hid it in the garage. And um, so about 10.30 at 11 o'clock at night, after everybody was asleep, I ran down the street, got the car, backed it into the driveway, loaded it all up. And then I went back inside and stood at the base of the stairs going up to his room and watched this clock that was on the wall in the, in the dining room until it hit midnight. And then I was legally free of him. And I turned around and left. Mm. Well, good for you. Yeah. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry for every child on earth that goes through something gnarly like that. It just kills me. And it happens all the time. It's happening probably at this very moment to some poor sure child out there. It just kills yeah. me. I hate it. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And that's, that's a huge issue for me is that understanding after you've lived your you know life for a long time that that that's the harm we're doing so often in society is we're creating these these people with broken minds and broken emotions and then we put them out there and we expect them to be normal and uh you know when we talk about what's going wrong with the world or what's going wrong with america to me that's a huge piece of that is that we're we're sending damaged humans out into the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about it, you're giving them power by giving them a Bible because if they be believe in God, then they think what they're doing that's so despicable is backed by God. This yeah. super being is telling them to go do these horrific acts and they right. become like a you know, a, a, a vice of God, this idea of God they had there. They're like, I'm just the vessel for the message. I don't, yeah. they, I'm not thinking anymore that I'm abusing children or whatever it is that they're doing out there. They right. think they're righteous That's and right. it's just disgusting. Yeah. yeah this, this idea that the Bible is this inspired, inerrant word of a creator gives it tremendous power. I remember, you know, I was watching my father and it was, he would spend so much time pouring over the words and because he was convinced that there was, there was information in there that humans weren't privy to, and he was going to find it. And I think that's what you're talking about, Tally, is that, that uh, people think that there's something there that we, the mass of humanity, can't understand, but I'm going to discover it, and then I'm going to cling to it, and I'm going to respond to it, and I'm going to behave. My actions are going to flow from it. And... They give no thought to whether in real life it's destructive or constructive. Well, you know, I think um, when you find something like that, you feel like you're, you're special in some way. And yes. all of a sudden you have a specialness about yourself you didn't have before. And there's this quote, I don't know who said it, but it's, there's no desire as common amongst humankind as the desire to be unique. Yes. So you feel, oh, I'm special. God loves me. I just need to share this with everyone. And you become this psycho. <laughs> so the, so and if, you, if you take that idea, Tally, and you apply it to Calvinism, it's just that much more intensified. Because not only are you somehow chosen, you're only one of 15 out of 7 billion that are chosen. Mm -hmm. That just ramps up that sense of uniqueness. And, yeah. and um, you have something special. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was intense. <laughs> um, actually, I relate to you a lot. I can't say that in any way, shape, or form I've had 
any of the severity of things that you've had, but I grew up with um, the Board of Education. I'm actually writing a song right now about that um, for our second album. But I also on our first album, I wrote a song called Pain um, for our Baby Eater album, where I expressed my childhood experience with my dad, where basically he used fear as a tactic to get me to believe in God. Um, however, as I get older, I wonder if it wasn't like so much a, a tactic, but if my dad really truly believed what he was telling me. Um, what he told me was that if Jesus, I would pray to Jesus to come into my heart. And I said that I'm not, I don't think Jesus is coming into my heart. How do I get him there? And um, he he said that if I don't have Jesus filling this in my heart, filling that space, that when I go to sleep at night and my mouth is open, demons will fly in and possess me. And that terrorized me. Just this one comment terrorized my brain. I, I became like an insomniac. I couldn't sleep. And I was scared of the dark for 20, 30 years. Still, sometimes I have these flashes of fear or something. If I catch myself in a dark place and I'm scared for a moment, I'll just go back to that for some weird reason. Um, but it's amazing what one sentence can do. Um, but yeah, I don't think one, one, one phrase and it, and the yeah. impact is tremendous. And it was probably a passing mm -hmm. thought mm -hmm. for him. Right. Yeah. And I've been thinking in my, as time goes on in my older age that maybe, um, you know, he wasn't actually like tactically trying to, manipulate me in some mean way he was actually acting out of love or caring because yeah. yes. he believes that he's scared for me that this could really happen to me yeah and it was actually a loving act on his part which i did not view it as that once yeah. i realized that there's no god i viewed it as he's being mean and horrific yeah no I, you know i um, think there's a lot of truth to that i think that's true for a lot of people so but that doesn't make the impact of it any less severe or mm -hmm. any less destructive, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that religious people are like consciously using manipulative tactics to influence? Or do you think these behaviors they're doing are actually born from love? Well, I, I've had people ask me over the years if, uh, if they thought that my father was doing this whole campaign because, you know, he was, it was just a cynical um, campaign to cause harm and, and um, to hurt people. And... <clears throat> As much as, you know, as intensely as I feel about the, the negative impacts of all that, but one thing I know for sure is that my father was sincere in what he was doing. He truly believed that what he was doing was right. He, um, some of the conversations I've had with some of my nieces and nephews that have left there, uh, in his later years, it, it just was um, more intensified. He was desperate to ensure his salvation and to uh, discover the truth of who God was. So I don't think, I, I've never thought that it was just cynicism on his part. Mm. Um, and, and I think for the most part that most folks out there have good intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, there, certainly there's always those outliers who are, are, you know, whether they call them psychopaths or sociopaths that are, are deliberately manipulative. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I think that's an important question. I think that's something that people need to understand because we get really, uh, self-righteous in, in the ideas that, that we attach ourselves to or that, that we, uh, embrace. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's easy to dismiss the ideas that, uh, are contrary or conflict with those by saying that the people are just being, uh, dishonest or manipulative. Right. <clears throat> And of course, um, I bumped the camera. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Is that right? Can yeah, you you're good us? there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, just kind of go on that. The you know when we're talking about intentions, a lot of people say, well, it's all about the intention, and the intention makes it all okay. But obviously, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, it's really important to be able to separate fact from fiction, and to be able to understand what makes something true. In order to make good decisions, when you're making decisions based on bad evidence, you can make really horrible decisions yeah. and do really terrible things to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and and you, you, you can do good. And I mean, there's a lot of religious people out there who are doing, are doing good things. You know, they're, 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 their theology, their God 
is what, uh, at least in their mind, is what drives them to help others and to to uh, contribute positively to society. But I'm I absolutely agree with that, Steve. That ultimately, it's critical that the basis for our beliefs have some uh, roots in in verifiable fact. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, we're ultimately we're bound to end up going down a road that's destructive to others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's sad. Um, actually, sorry, real quick, Steve, can you go up so I can see? Because I think the first one. I have to go. Sorry, I missed a question. I think. Oh. Okay. Yes. Report. Okay. So I did miss a question, sorry about that. Um, While I was preparing for this interview, I watched your TED talk. That was really good. Um, Thank you for doing that. That was very courageous of you. I think I would pee my pants up there. So, oh my gosh. I I almost did. Um, so you mentioned so many things that I identified with and I'd like to know a little bit more um, you said you struggled with a God that is hardwired into your brain. I like yeah. the way you put that. Um, it, you mentioned a couple of the ways it was hardwired in, but did you have like summer school or like um, summer camp or like what are other ways that was there a community? I had a community around me where I went to summer school and summer camp and some of this. Uh, yeah. And um, anyway, do you have well, like that kind well, of imp stuff? My not so much. I mean, it, it was, you know, besides the times that when our father would be trying to bring us up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, um, which translated to beatings and screaming, um, it was that we were in church every Sunday, twice every Sunday for a total of about three hours. And he would expound on and went deep into the Bible. And um, one of the things that he prided himself on, it was just part of that idea that they were, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church is unique in the world, was that they didn't tolerate any kind of, uh, I don't know even what the word is, but any ideas that weren't consistent with what he thought the Bible taught. So if he, he, he didn't care who it was, if it was... Billy Graham, if it was Robert Schuller, any anybody who was out there proposing ideas about who God was and what the doctrines of the Bible should be, and they didn't fit his idea, he would attack it. And he, he prided himself on the fact that, that the church basically consisted of his family and two other small families. Uh, anytime anybody would show up, you know, you know, the driving down the road, oh, let's check this church out, right? Uh, you would see this glint in his eye when they walked through the door and he would take the sermon and very, very elaborate, deliberate process of, you know, so everybody in the, in the pews would know what was going on. He'd take his sermon and he would slide it on the shelf under the, under the uh, pulpit. And he would pull out his other sermon that he reserved for newcomers. Mm -hmm. And he would set out in the next hour and a half, just blasting them. And it worked. Oh, and why? so rarely did anybody come more than once, right? So, <laughs> so we Whoa. were a very isolated, insulated group mm. of just, you know, that, you know, 15 members in our family and another 10 in the other two families. But it was tight. And, you know, you talked about that sense of, of, of specialness. I can remember many times as a kid because the way the church is built, it's half of it is built into the ground. So the windows were up high and they kind of looked out onto street level, you know, just right at the, at the curb level. And so it was a very, you know, it'd be dark outside. He'd be preaching. Um, it was very cozy and comfortable. You felt like you were nestled in this one little safe spot in the world Mm. and you were safe there. You were, you, you were special and, Um, but that's, that was basically it. We got all of our theology directly from our father and he didn't tolerate anything else coming in. Wow. That's, that's very cultish in a way. It is. Yeah. Like growing up on a commune, you have that sort of 
very isolated um, yeah. growing up experience as a child on a commune. Yeah. But I remember when they, he first started out and, and the, the news was starting to report on them with their, their picketing campaign. I remember being very offended when people called it a cult because I still held all those thoughts and ideas. You, you, you talked about the hardwiring. You don't realize how many ideas you, you know, how, how complex and interwoven all of these ideas are in your brain until something comes along that forces you to challenge just one of them. So you pick one of those threads, you address it, you look at it and you say, okay, well, no, that doesn't work. So you let that one go. That doesn't mean you let everything else go. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I mean when I'm talking about being hardwired in your, your it's there. Mm -hmm. And until you examine each little piece of that, you still respond to the world with those ideas. Mm -hmm. Has it been a struggle to overcome that way of thinking and just learn how to get along in the regular world and shut it's, out or figure, pick what's reality, this or that? Like, it seems like it'd be really chaotic and confusing. Yeah, it, it is. It's a lifelong process. You, you never completely let go of it. What I, what I talk about is that you, you rewrite the tapes as you are motivated to by life's experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And but those tapes are still playing back there, and and oftentimes they'll come back in, knock you down and into a hole, and then you have to spend the time to rationalize yourself back out of it, right? Yeah. Well, I I kind of get what you're saying there, because I grew up with you know I grew up in the Mormon Church, so there was a lot of ideas and beliefs that were hardwired into my upbringing, yeah. and um basically it wasn't just realizing that there very probably is no god there's also all these other hard wirings that i have to deconstruct like yeah. the mormon view on the um on on marriage or on you know being gay or just on all kinds of different things but those are probably really big ones and of course you know drugs the word of wisdom uh, all kinds of different things that, you know, uh, they believe. And so it was also a process of, of letting those beliefs go as well as letting the God belief go. And yeah. it took a long time to be able to, to accept that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a journey. It's not a switch. You don't just hit a switch and all of a sudden all your thinking changes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can, I can narrow it down to one time where my thinking started to change, but it was a long process to fully, get out of that kind of thinking. Yeah. Uh, um, and then uh, I think an, a comment here that's pretty good is uh, YouTube me uh, says, I know that exclusive views are one of the first things to look for in identifying an actual cult. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably pretty true. You know, yeah. s saying that you have something exclusive, something special directly from yeah. God. Now, of course, yeah. every religion has that to a degree, but uh, cults seem to, to have quite a bit more of it, I guess. Yep. Um, well, you could see how Fred wouldn't be able to recognize that because he really believed the Bible's word. So the Bible's telling him, and other people do have the Bible, so he probably thinks he's right. He is interpreting the word better. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> he spent a lot others. of time with, with the old primitive Baptist um, leaders and you know their expositions that they had written over the years. And... It got to the point where you know how, like in in the in uh, Islam, they they don't just have the Quran; they have several other sources that are considered just as uh, profound and holy as as the Quran is. Well, Christianity doesn't really have that, but they behave as though they have it with a lot of those expositions that are out there, right? Right. Mm -hmm. They they take on the same um, significance in practice and in the development of, in, you know, the individual theologies of these, of these groups, uh, as the Bible does. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, I guess the thing that's interesting to me is that you left, in my view, you left the, the church very young. Like basically once the clock struck such a time and you were 18, you're like, I'm done. And so what was it that made you decide to leave so soon? And how, well, was, how was that for you? 
you know, I, I guess the best way to say it is that I just developed this sense of, of um, I didn't belong there, that I was an outlier, it didn't fit uh, me. Interestingly enough, it had nothing to do with the religion. I, I left there believing that I was going to go to hell because of this decision that I made. And I believed that uh, it was going to, that sometime around the year 2000, Christ was going to return. So I left with this kind of mantra in my mind that, okay, you basically have until you're 40 to live your life. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to live my life on my terms. And then I'll deal with that when it comes kind of thing. Right. <laughs> and not realizing that that's really a very self-destructive, terrifying mm. belief that, that you're carrying around in your head. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and I remember right. as, as, as two, the year 2000 approached and everybody's dealing with, Oh, you know, all the computers are going to break down and everything's going to go wonky on us. All I could think about was, yeah, and I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, but in a, in a way, that must have taken a lot of courage because you think yeah. I'm going to hell anyway, but I've, I'm going to get out of this place. Yeah, I just you didn't know? see it as, as a choice. I, you know, it's, it got to the point where I didn't belong there. I have a question because um, I don't know. I endured a few things, nothing like your story at all, but just a few things, probably even normal people. I don't know um, as a child, but I had a younger brother and I always felt like I had to protect him. When you left, did you have guilty issues after you left or thinking about even leaving because you'd be leaving behind your younger siblings that are getting hurt over there? And you could have, if you stay, maybe protect them instead? Or did no, you not you know, think about that? that that's something that I haven't, I haven't spent enough time on uh, to be able to explain it clearly. What you have to understand and when, you're, when you live in an environment like that where you're, you're literally always reading the subtext to see where danger lies in that situation. Mm -hmm. It becomes a very isolating experience. It becomes a very self-serving experience um, where each child basically is going to look out for themselves and they, they have no qualms in their, in their, their behavior. I can't speak for what's in their mind. But they had no qualms throwing someone else under the bus if it was going to protect them no. because the harm was so uh, potentially so dangerous that all you could think was when you were in that circumstance was, how can I avoid this? How can I get out of it? So that led to um, kind of an isolation, even among the, the siblings, right? I mean, we got along on the surface. We, we did things together. But when push came to shove, there, there really wasn't this ability to connect closely with individual siblings. And even today, I've got, you know, two other siblings, a brother and a sister who left there. And it's a challenge to maintain, really develop and maintain a close relationship with them. Hmm. That's so sad, man. I just feel like religion divides even within families like this. It just sure. It divides everywhere on every level, whether it's country, dividing country dividing all the way down to the, the family members and children. It even divides children from the other children in their own family, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Man, it's just so evil. If there ever is a time I would use the word evil to describe how religion yeah. divides. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Tally. <laughs> all right, you want to okay. do this? Okay, and so last, last question for you real quick. Um, well, not the last question, but one of the last questions is obviously uh, you left still believing. Now you're an atheist. So how do you see the world different now that you've lost religion? Do you feel like you have a better view of the world or is it more, uh, you know, a lot of people say you can become nihilistic when you lose religion. Right. And, and I've dealt with, with uh, some aspects of that. I don't, I don't like the term nihilism because people pile on to that, that think that word or that idea so much negative. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, quite frankly, you know, pushing through all of the issues as I, and, and like I was saying earlier, it's a process, right? So I reached a point where I woke up one day and realized, wow, I'm an atheist. Right. <laughs> but I, it took years to get there and then you mm -hmm. get there and then you start, 
kind of playing around in that area and trying to figure out, well, okay, so what does that exactly mean? Uh, what do I believe? And then there's a lot of ideas out there that, that are suggested that that's what that means. So you have to figure it out for yourself. But one of the biggest issues that I had to confront and still to some degree am addressing is this idea that if there isn't anything after, and this is all we have, wow, why do you do what you do? Why do we, why do we buy into the systems that exist? And, and it's a kind of a frightening scenario that when I'm done, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have to deal with that. You have to process through it. And I remember I watched a, uh, a documentary a few years back called uh, Flight from Death, where a couple of scientists had taken this. There was a theory proposed back in the 70s called the terror management theory, where the scientists basically said that because humans are exclusively able to contemplate their eventual demise, it creates an existential terror in them, and they will develop the most elaborate systems to keep that terror at bay. And, you know, suggesting that that's why things like religions and uh, other cultural systems are developed. In large part, it's to keep that, that uh, deep anxiety away from you, right? Yeah. Um, and, and as a result of that, anything that, that threatens that belief system, the response can be vicious and violent, right? You're not going to mm -hmm. tolerate anybody challenging the idea that, something positive happens after, after this. Yeah. So. Which is unfortunate because that's the way it really is. And that idea needs to be challenged. Yeah. Uh, but it's a hard one. And it's one of the reasons that so, or one of the reasons that obviously so many religions exist is because of the fear of death. Yeah. The, and, the, and the promise of an afterlife is just a way so to escape tantalizing. that fear. It's, it's yeah, very tantalizing. You can be, you know, especially with my upbringing, it was, oh, you can be with your family forever. Um, so you never have to lose those family ties that are so important, which I can see that's very, uh, as a parent, it's it's very tantalizing. I don't know so much as a child. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. up, you don't worry about like... it too much at that point, right? <laughs> you right, got more you... important things to think about. When yeah, <laughs> but as a as a parent, you know, you want to keep that connection for sure. And also as a child, you still want to have that connection with your parents, even though it's, you want it to be a little bit more distant yeah. than probably a, as a, as a parent. But uh, it's very tempting, and it's. Um, obvious why religions would be gravitated towards this idea that you don't really die when you die. Yeah. But, um, but I, but I have to wonder, Steve, what, what <laughs> if we could embrace the idea as a, you know, as a world, as a, as a, a society of people that, okay, we, we know that's nonsense. We have, well, we know that there's no way of knowing what happens after we die other than we die, we, we cease to exist. And what if we could, could grab a hold of that and then start having conversations and say, okay, if that's true, and, and this is all we have, then what changes in our thinking and our behavior and our, how we develop our societies can we make that improve the quality and the experiences that we have while we're alive? And then we start moving in the direction of it suddenly becoming a high priority that we don't do harm to children as they're growing up because we understand that we basically ruined them. Mm -hmm. You know, that we, we broke that one because we treated them the way we did or we, you know, we, we taught them these things and now they're broken. Instead mm -hmm. of doing that, we, we make it a high priority to ensure that our kids grow up with a clarity and with a, a sense of safety and security and joy so that they can go out and live the absolutely best life possible and make that a high priority in societies. You know, that kind of thinking is what, what I believe would change if we could let go of these ideas that something ha ha happens after this. Because mm -hmm. as long as we believe that and we don't focus enough attention, enough resources on what happens here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's happening right now to, to ourselves and millions of other people. I think if, if we made that change, then a lot of positive things would happen politically around the world and also, you know, within human beings. There might be a lot less people willing to die for or, or, or kill for certain causes 
if right. they believed that this is all they got. Right. Yeah. And there would be people who don't, you know, choose prayer over medicine for their children <laughs> yeah. or themselves. Yeah. yeah. There would be so many, Much, so many positive changes. Like it, it would, would just to, explode out. <laughs> we, we'd have to write, I could write like a hundred things immediately that I, my brain is thinking of that would change your, for the better. Yeah. Discipline your children based on rational ideas rather than what it says in some book that was written who knows how long ago. Exactly. Thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. So much more. Uh, base, basically, once you throw that idea out, you're pretty much forced into skepticism if you want to make any sense of the world, in, into looking at the world and what can you actually prove? What mm -hmm. can actually be shown to be true and how should I actually live my life? Yeah. So if, once you believe that there, this is all you've got, the only way to make sense of that is by looking at evidence and, and understanding what is actually happening here and now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, as flawed as we are in our ability to do that, we need to make that a priority. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Yep. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Nate. It's my, my pleasure. Been a super so, pleasure. I have been so excited about this episode for so long because I've been following your story for a few years now, and I, I really relate to a lot of the things that you say. Um, all right. Um, real quick. Yeah. Real quick. <laughs> just because you asked earlier, so I'm going to show the people who are watching. What does my shirt say? <laughs> God hates facts. <laughs> yes. And mine's yeah. not quite as good, but I'm going to show it off. <laughs> Fake news. Right on. Oh, I love that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. so, so do you get responses for that shirt? <laughs> um, I, I do. I certainly do when I wear it around. Yes. Um, nobody really says anything, but they give me the... They give you the pink eye. <laughs> the Google, oh, yeah. <laughs> it totally happened today when I was at the store uh, getting ready for the show. There was this guy that came in there, and he just no could not stop staring at my chest. I was like, I know it's You're not like, quite what, that interesting. Do I have boobs or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, you guys. So I got to tell you a quick story. Do we have time? Sure. Yeah. yeah. We have a few so minutes. you asked yeah. earlier, one of your uh, this or that questions was Kansas or Boston, mm -hmm. which, by yeah. the way, I, I love Boston. <laughs> Not, Me too. I'm not say anything that would have been possible. my pick. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I grew up there in, in Kansas, right? And, and when I was, was still living at home, I, I worked a lot in my father's law office. And the bass player for Kansas, Dave, uh, Doug Hope, his, his brother Dave, was an attorney there in Topeka. So I mm. got this idea. I, I had gone to this, uh, I'd seen Kansas like two or three times. And at one of the concerts, I was up near the, the front of the stage, and I saw all these people backstage with, you know, their backstage passes. And I think, God, I want that so bad because I just love that group, right? right? So I'm talking to some friends, you know, a few weeks later, and I came up with this idea. So I, I wrote a letter to the governor of Kansas at the time. His name was John Carlin. And I said, would you consider signing a proclamation declaring one day out of the year Kansas the band day in the state of Kansas? And shockingly they responded really quickly and they, oh yeah i'd love to do that right so i mm -hmm. spent the next about year and a half um and it during that time i moved from um i was living in kansas city at the time i moved from there to southern california so that was back in 81. um i had to write the proclamation myself and uh, submit it to the governor's office and i was working i with uh the uh group group's um, management company out in Southern California. And it finally came together. So, they, they, so officially, June 28th in the state of Kansas is Kansas the Band Day. <laughs> and That's awesome. after it all happened, you know, they had a signing at the governor's office and I had to listen to it over the phone because I was living in California then. Um, I got a letter from the band all signed by all the members. But unfortunately, by then, Steve Walsh had just left the band, and so it was John Elefante was the lead singer. So I didn't ever get Steve Walsh's signature, but I did get the coveted backstage passes, and I got to see him, meet him in, uh, at uh, Universal Studios when they were there for the Vinyl Confessions Tour. That's awesome. So, so that's my rock, godless rock story. Yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a badass story. Yeah. So. Very cool. 
We have another on the books. quick question here. We do what? To from from one of our viewers. Oh yeah. Cool. Um, so this might be too personal, he says. If if it is, you know, feel free not to delve into this. But um, do you have any major issues with uh, post traumatic stress regarding the experiences that you had? I do. Yeah. Oh yeah, a lot of them. I've dealt with. I I was in a. Uh, I'd, I'd been to two, two different counselors. At one point, I went deliberately and found a counselor who was, uh, was, um, had a theology background and, and a uh, psychology background. And we spent about a year and a half working. Basically, he, he put me through what he said was about a two-year course on, on uh, uh, biblical hermeneutics, mm. you know, how to interpret the Bible. And... Mm. Uh, and then I spent another six months with another doctor a few years later, and and he ended up putting me in a, um, a psych hospital for two weeks. So, and you know, it's it's one of those things that you never it never goes away. But like I was saying earlier, you you develop coping techniques and you mm -hmm. you you rewrite the tapes. And so when you find yourself uh, succumbing to some of those old messages, you, you have strategies for getting away from it. Mm. So. So I have an interesting idea. I think that overcoming a severely put on you religious upbringing, overcoming that when you want to escape it, I think it's almost similar to the types of things that might happen when you are um, going through grieving for it, the death of a loved one. Yes. You experience anger maybe. It, everybody does it in their own way, but there's those like, I don't know, five, seven, ten stages, whatever they talk about, anger, denial, um, bargaining, bargaining. bargaining yeah. you probably go through all acceptance. just so many things yeah. like, ultimately hopefully acceptance right yeah um yeah very interesting yeah, yeah. and in a way uh, on actually it's, it's kind of funny because you also have to accept your own death your own imminent death if yeah talking about grieving that's you true don't just lose your religion you also lose your eternal your, uh, your existence you lose your illusion <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your delusions. And, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people lose their families, like you've lost you know, yeah. contact with uh, mm -hmm. family members and things. So in a way, you are experiencing the death of the way you knew your life and the people you loved. It's totally changed. So you do suffer um, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things and have to go through that, that grueling -ness. In a way, it's, it's, it, makes it, easy to it makes it understandable why so many people push back so hard against learning new things about their religion, reading yeah. passages that are uncomfortable in the Bible, yeah. uh, thinking about um, evolution and, and the, the fact that the earth is four and a half billion years old instead of 6,000. Right. Uh, you know, all these, there's, there's so many different things that you have to break down really yeah. in, in different people with different beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this whole process, you know, it's frustrating me because I want, I want it all to change now. And it's just not going to, mm -hmm. but right. it's important that we keep having these conversations. We keep putting that out there. And mm -hmm. it's important to try to figure out new ways to reach across the divide and develop relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, even the Bible, Paul was smart enough to talk about that, how um, you, you have to, if you're going to um, reach someone, of course, he was talking about the, you know, when they were in error. But uh, mm -hmm. you need to find someone who has a relationship with that person and, and send them in to talk to them because mm -hmm. he understood the importance of relationship, right? So that's a big piece of this whole puzzle, too, is we got to figure out ways to uh, connect with others. Right now, what I see we're doing is there's those who are kind of on the edge or on the fence, and they'll reach out and try to get input and understanding from the other side to help them. But the ones who are enmeshed in it, you pretty much just have to wait for something to change in their life because it's too mm -hmm. important. It's too interwoven. It's, it's too mm -hmm. integral a part of their lives for them to just up and change it because we said it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well said. Yep. All right, Nate, this has been a heavy, but also very fun conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we're at, oh, we're going to do our little outro now, yeah? Yeah, no. Let's... First, we're going to ask him. Uh, do you oh, have yeah. any, we're, we're about to wrap it up, but yeah. do you have any questions for us, Nate, while we're, while we're here? Well, I just – so do you guys have a website for your, for your music? Um, absolutely. We have yeah. monsterandsunday.com. You can also okay. find our music um, a number of other places, but you can buy our album right there. 
And okay. we're doing a promo on it as well. So we've got uh, music merch and more sale going on if you go to the website. But you can find it all kinds of places. And uh, good, like because yeah, because I that's one of the things when I was was running CFI in uh, Calgary is to me it's important to to develop these kind of uh, you know social systems uh, arts. Mm -hmm. for the secular community because it's, mm -hmm. it's just not much of it there, right? So yes. absolutely, we are yeah. huge advocates of if you're an atheist and you have a talent of any sort, please just come out with it. Are you a painter? Do do some sort of atheist artwork or just, you know, show yeah. yourself to the world because yeah. we, we need you out there. Because we still and need all you're... of that. We need that mm -hmm. as humans. Mm -hmm. We've been getting it over the centuries through our religion, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, religion mm -hmm. or church became the center point of, of lives and that's where you got most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the things that you lose. So we've got to, we've got to recreate it for ourselves. <laughs> but, um, yes. Chadwick says baby eater best album ever. <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I've got to give him a shout out for that. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was our album one. We're working on album two right now. Yeah. So, so it's, right um, we're, right. we're, we're just about done the demos for it. We still have some work to do. All right. So, well, this was great, you guys. Yes. Thank you Thank for you joining us. Much. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on our show. Yeah. All right. Until next time. So until next time, we're, we're Monster, Monster Monster Monday! Monday! <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Godless, Godless Rockers. Rockers. All right, guys. Take care. All right. See you. Bye.